Thank you. That's a lot of people right in front of me. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the NSTA National Conference and all of the science educators here. Uh, shortly after uh, becoming Texas Instruments uh, brand ambassador, I actually attended the NSTA uh, conference in Indianapolis. Um, so was anybody there? Did you see me there? Yeah. Okay. Well, hello again. Um, it was a great experience and uh, really happy to be back at NSTA and very honored to, uh, to speak to you this morning. I'd like to thank all of you, uh, as Nick just did, for your commitment to education and for inspiring future generations of STEM leaders um, like Nick Lombardo, who I also hope will become a teacher, but that's just my personal uh, desire. Um, thank you, Nick, for that beautiful introduction. And obviously, I'm here, I guess, first and foremost, as uh, a scientist, as Nick mentioned. I'm a, a doctor of neuroscience, um, but I am also um, an actress, and I am um, not only a scientist, but play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my, my third year uh, and counting as a STEM education advocate, working with Texas Instruments um, as their brand ambassador, and also I'm, I'm a teacher as well and, and have taught, uh, taught for many years, um, both through my training in school and after receiving my PhD. Obviously, following Nick's progress has been really special because of how we met, and Nick obviously represents why many of us are here today. As you heard, Nick, Nick wrote a really special essay um, that, that sort of highlighted two aspects of my interest and my commitment off screen in, in STEM education and, and STEM um, technology. The, the first was his commitment not only to, um, to, to earn this kind of technology for his use at his school, but his desire to be able to use that uh, for the community and for his school once he left. And that really touched me that he had that, that sort of, that set of planning in his mind um, that he didn't just want this for him and for his colleagues, but um, so that his school and his community would be able to benefit from it for years. And the second thing about Nick's essay, which he touched on a little bit when he um, spoke to you, he singled out his, um, his calculus teacher, his AP calculus teacher, Mr. Pigeon. And this is really what struck me about his essay, and that's um, honestly what made his essay stand out to me. He mentioned that Mr. Pigeon would come in when he didn't need to. He would come in on weekends. He would stay after. Um, and the fact that that happened was not surprising to me. I come from a family of teachers, and I know that that's what many teachers who care that deeply will do. But the fact that, that Nick recognized that and singled that out as his motivation for wanting to, to win this technology um, for Mr. Pigeon, that was really what was so touching to me. So that sort of passion for teaching and appreciation for teaching, as I said, comes from my personal experience as well. My parents are first generation Americans and they were public school teachers for a combined 70 years of public school service. Um, My parents were, uh, were public school teachers at a time when uh, being a teacher was more than teaching. It was being part of a movement and a community. Uh, they taught in, in Harlem and in the Bronx, and my parents participated in um, sit-ins to allow African-American students into the public schools in New York. So I grew up with a, a tremendous notion of teaching. <laughs> um, I grew up with a tremendous notion of teaching not only as instruction, but again, as being part of a larger community and building a family in your classroom and in your school. So um, I was raised with, with this tremendous respect for, for teachers. Um, you know, my, my parents respected, um, respected administrators, but obviously I heard a lot of the bureaucracy of the teaching system in my, in my house growing up, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but in an age of, you know, the, the changing standards for teachers and as my father would say, I'm always being asked to teach to a test now. It didn't used to be like that. Um, you know, my parents' patience was tested, is what was tested in those years. Um, but the dedication to students and, as I said, to the community at large through teaching um, was something I was raised to not only revere but to pursue for myself as well. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you for being part of that as well. 
Incredible things happen, as you know, when students are excited about learning and engaged in learning. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to, to see that in action and to, to work with students and teachers around the country. And my, my firsthand experience is that amazing things happen when, when students feel empowered and engaged. Um, I got to visit some of the, um, the tech active classrooms in Sarasota, Florida, um, spent some time there. And um, the, the kind of three things that stood out to me was this, this notion of student-led inquiry and student-led investigation which is something that I really craved as, as a young student, specifically in, in science. Um, and that really wasn't available to me growing up in, in the 70s and 80s. Um, I actually went to public school my entire life, and I'm a product of the, um, the busing system of the 1970s and 80s, where, where children, I'm sure you know, were taken from poorer neighborhoods and um, taken to schools that had more opportunity. So I'm a, I'm a, proud, a, a proud product of the public school system. and. Um, I think that deserves applause. The public school system is fantastic. It can be. But a lot of the teaching style um, that was sort of popular was, was not necessarily student-led. And so that's some of what I've gotten to see firsthand, what a classroom can look like when the inquiry, the investigation is, is absolutely student-led. Um, engagement with technology is something, you know, I remember um, in the 70s, the first time I ever saw a computer was in a math class at my elementary school. It must have been 1979, and it was a gigantic monster of a thing. I think it was like an RCA, and we would do simple addition and subtraction on this gigantic um, computer. Um, but to be able to see what technology can look like, specifically with, with science, with math, um, it's absolutely incredible, and I think most importantly, um, when, when I was in these classrooms, I saw excitement and joy over all of the students' faces. And I know that's not always possible to reach every single kid. I mean, I've taught in small classrooms and bigger ones, um, but to have that sense of excitement and joy, uh, it, it's incredibly powerful. So when students specifically begin to um, think like real life scientists and when they get to do things that make them feel like real life mathematicians and when they get to solve real world, pr real world problems when they're exposed to STEM career fields and when they see some of those larger possibilities I think that's where incredible learning can happen. So what these kinds of experiences have reinforced for me is that obviously teaching must inspire and engage while we challenge and why, while we teach sort of larger concepts um, but in addition, we need to specifically teach STEM. We need to teach STEM and all sort of related fields um, creatively and dynamically so that we can reach more students in more ways. And one of the ways that, um, that I've been involved with doing this is by adding um, a little bit of Hollywood magic into the classroom. And um, I'm gonna talk more about this in a few minutes, but um, first I'd like to talk a little bit more specifically about um, how we can try and avoid students being overlooked when it comes to this kind of STEM education. So we've all seen the statistics on how the United States is lagging behind much of the world in STEM. I'm confident that you probably all understand better than anyone that we must solve this problem. The success of our global economy, our very way of life, depends on having a highly skilled and, and motivated STEM workforce. Stories like Nick's, stories of students who want to be scientists, students who know that very early are very inspiring. Nick challenged himself. He got the support he needed to do well in high school. He continues to excel um, in a variety of STEM subjects in, in university. And I'm sure, I know that there are many students like Nick out there, but um, I also know that there are um, probably more students who lack that kind of confidence and who need more encouragement in the first place. Um, I was one of those students. I actually arrived very late to the world of STEM. Um, I, I was not a, a shy child, um, <laughs> but when it came to, um, to science and math, I really, really shrunk. And it was beyond being shy, I was extremely insecure. Um, it did not come naturally to me to understand science concepts or math concepts, and I assumed that because it didn't come naturally to me, that meant I wasn't good at it. And I'm sure you know what that looks like. That leads to um, a lot of shame and a lot of fear. And um, my parents, because they were teachers, always told me I have to sit in the front row. So I wasn't the shy kid in back. I was a shy kid in front, which was even more awkward. Um, I, I was on a, a TV show in my teen years, and uh, it was called Blossom. And oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, 
And it was during my years on Blossom that uh, I, was, I had a biology tutor. I was about 15, I guess, when I um, had to take biology. And she was, at that time, a dental student at UCLA. She's now a dental surgeon. But she answered an ad that was posted at UCLA for a Hollywood actress who needs a biology tutor. And she, um, she answered that ad, and it was me. And um, this woman was the, the first female role model I had had. It was the first time I had worked one-on-one -on -one, uh, with someone to help me understand things in a way that my brain could understand them. And it was literally that one woman who I am forever indebted to who gave me um, not only the skill set, because it's one thing, as you know, to teach a skill set and to be able to give someone proficiency in these kinds of skills. Bless you. But um, <laughs> it's a whole other thing to give someone the confidence, the confidence that I was lacking to believe that I could be a scientist. And I think what was important was that um, she didn't tell me that it was going to be easy and that it was going to be as easy as all the kids that it came naturally to. Because it wasn't. I had a really hard time when I got to college. Um, I had to play catch up. I had to get my calculus and my chemistry up to where everybody else's was. And I struggled um, through college. And I even struggled in grad school because this stuff does not come naturally to me. Um, I gave a talk last night at Northeastern University um, for a bunch of undergrads. And I told them, I worked so hard for that B minus in organic chemistry. <laughs> Yay for B minus in organic chemistry. Um, what I'd like to emphasize, um, though, obviously, is that every teacher um, has the ability to make that kind of difference in a student's life, and you all know that. Um, this, this one woman was able to take me down the STEM path um, and transform my life in, in really an, an unimaginable way. And, and as Nick described, you know, um, I, I want to see the universe the way I've been given the skill set to see it. It's the only way I can imagine going through life, so I'm forever grateful um, that I was introduced to STEM, um, even though it was later in life. So let's get back to a little Hollywood magic, because as you all know, my day job is that I'm an actress. You know when they say, don't quit your day job? <laughs> so um, it makes a certain amount of sense for me to tie my day job um, into what I get to do on my, on my off time. So that brings me to, to STEM behind Hollywood. So there's, there's sort of two ways that um, that Hollywood and science can come together in, in fun and, and sort of remarkable ways. Um, and, and this gives us the opportunity um, to, to make this kind of learning engaging and relevant to the next generation of STEM lovers. So the, the first point is that there are so many kind of STEM-driven um, careers and STEM-driven aspects to so much of what, um, what Hollywood presents us. So, um, you know, take any movie you'd like. Uh, my examples are, are Gravity or the Lego movie. I enjoyed immensely. Um, um, Despicable Me, these are, these are examples of, of, of worlds that involve STEM intensive work um, to make these things come to life. The army of engineers and in some cases scientists and technologists um, who are sort of making this kind of magic happen with CGI and with animation, uh, with various aspects of engineering and editing. Um, there is a, a whole interesting set of, of career opportunities that, that are STEM related. But in addition, Hollywood can also be a, a powerful teaching tool that can bring science and math concepts to life in the classroom. So my work with Texas Instruments and the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Science and Entertainment Exchange, um, is the STEM Behind Hollywood program. And uh, last August, I was in San Francisco with Dr. Steve Schlossman, who's a Harvard professor and he's a psychiatrist, but he's also an author and a sort of resident zombie expert. Um, He's going to be my co-presenter in today's special STEM Behind Hollywood session. And we worked together with students last August on the very first STEM Behind Hollywood activity, which is called Zombie Apocalypse. Now, what I love most about this program is that it's called Zombie Apocalypse. <laughs> but it also gives educators um, access to free content and tools to engage students in really kind of complicated and powerful scientific discussions around topics that um, kids find cool and entertaining and very engaging. So um, why is this effective? These are, these are kinds of topics that do more than entertain. Um, they actually give us the opportunity to teach real math and science concepts. So in the example of zombies, um, we actually teach um, exponential growth curves. We teach human anatomy in function and in dysfunction. Um, there's uh, epidemiology in there, infectious disease, and also a little bit of health planning, believe it or not, like public health issues. Um, 
things like CSI, you know, we know give the opportunity to teach about forensic anthropology and, and genetics and anatomical degradation. Um, the notion of superheroes, um, which is a uh, next field that we're hoping to get into. Um, I'm sure anyone who reads comic books like I do uh, knows that um, all the special abilities of superheroes, whether it's Flash or Superman or, or Spider-Man or even Hulk, um, involve aspects of, of science and, and in some cases technology, math. The Hulk is more of a psychiatric issue, but still, that's science, you know? <laughs> um, and there are countless other entertainment topics that, that we think are ripe for scientific inquiry, um, which STEM Behind Hollywood is uh, exploring using real, wor real world simulations. So students are not just talking about hypothetical situations, but they're becoming characters in the plot of, of solving these problems using technology and using the tools that actual science are using in the lab and in the field. So Dr. Schlossman and I um, are gonna share all about that program and, and do a demo of Zombie Apocalypse um, during a session actually right in this room at noon today. So um, if your schedule permits, we would love to talk zombies with you. It's really awesome. Um, in closing, um, I, I'd like to thank you all for having me here. Obviously, we all hope to encourage, encourage more students to be interested in STEM by exploring topics that ignite their imaginations and their passion. And I promise it doesn't take um, an actress like me to deliver that message. We are all in a position as teachers, as administrators, as educators um, to touch one student, to touch many students, to make them believe. I'm, I'm grateful to be here to, to support you and to do my part to inspire people. And um, who knows, you might, um, you might inspire the, the insecure girl in the front row to embrace her inner nerd and get a PhD in neuroscience and maybe she'll even make it her day job. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, and I look forward to spending an amazing day with you today. <laughs> thank you. That's, wow, thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, we're going to do a little Q&A, so you, please sit. That's very kind, and I'm going to call my parents right after I leave here, and they're going to be so happy I spoke to all these teachers. So we're going to do a QA. and a I'm going to move over here, though. Uh, okay, am I on? I'll, can I be heard? Okay, good. Um, I wanted to first, I think, uh, what uh, Mayim's life and the work she has done certainly tells us the possibilities uh, that are out there. And uh, before I uh, uh, start questions, I had uh, wanted to make an acknowledgement and a confession. And my acknowledgement is, uh, is to Texas Instruments, who sponsored this, uh, and I, we need to have a big round of applause for <laughs> Texas Instruments. And when you enter the exhibit floor later today, uh, I would encourage you, because uh, you'll see Texas Instruments booth right in front of you when you go in, I encourage you to stop and thank them for uh, <laughs> sponsoring this event. Uh, now for my confession, uh, Mayim, uh, that, uh, you know, I fell in love with you. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> actually, when, uh, the first time you tap danced as, as a young Bette Midler, I uh, fell in love with you, and so. And I just want you to know that I don't hold any grudges that you find Sheldon more appealing than I do. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm glad there's a little space between us. This could get fiery. <laughs> Okay, so the, our first question, uh, how do you think the Big Bang Theory has impacted people's perceptions of scientists? Wow, um, I, in two ways. Uh, the, the first way, um, you know, I, I've heard a certain amount of criticism, you know, which exists uh, about our show that, um, you know, that we stereotype or that we're making fun of, of scientists, um, but, you know, for, for me, coming from the world of, of academia and doing an undergrad degree and a graduate degree in neuroscience, um, I know people like all those people on our show. <laughs> um, you know, my, my character is obviously based on, on the Sheldon character, but I also based her uh, pretty strongly on uh, one female professor of mine in particular. And, um, you know, many of our writers have science backgrounds or spouses with science backgrounds. Um, our writers seem a lot more like a group of scientists than comedy writers. Um, in that they are very, very tender and loving towards um, all, all types of nerd and geek because they <laughs> are them. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, I think it's important to remember that we are, we're, we're entertainers, that's our job. Um, comedy's supposed to be funny, we're not doing a documentary. 
So um, that's sort of the first aspect. The, the second level of, of perception, which I think is, um, I think really important, is that we have a show you know, based around a group of people who, um, who live and exist in a way that is not really consistent with sort of cultural norms of, of hipness or popularity. And I think in particular, the Amy and Sheldon relationship demonstrates that um, to, to a large extent. You know, we have a group of characters, none of whom have diagnoses on or off camera. Um, <laughs> and we, we, we make sure that we don't label. Our plot lines are never about trying to change the quirks about these characters. It's about how they exist in the real and normal world with all of their quirks intact. And I think it's really important that, uh, you know, that, that it be emphasized that our show is, is demonstrating that there's someone for everyone, whether it's in a social environment, in a romantic capacity. Um, I think that's really sweet, and I think it's a much more powerful message um, than, the, than the first. So I know my, one of the things that we, um, we share with you as science teachers is that teach, teaching science is a form of entertainment. And so, <laughs> so we do uh, share that with you. And you mentioned your uh, professor and certainly your parents, but what was your, uh, were there any other big influences on your uh, inspiration to go into um, science and science ed? Yeah, my, um, my physics teacher who, um, he's passed away actually, he passed away recently. My physics teacher in junior high, um, Professor Fitzgibbons, he was, a, he was a PhD professor who taught middle school physics. Um, and he was a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher and um, very unusual person. Um, you know, he would sometimes fall asleep during slideshows, you know. Um, but he was so beloved. He was um, exceptionally, exceptionally quirky. Um, but I, I admired him so much because he was exceptionally quirky. Um, he was so respected among the other teachers and our administration. Uh, he was so beloved, and it, I did my first report on Albert Einstein in his class, um, and he was a, a huge influence um, on me. And certainly there's no science teachers out there uh, sitting here today who are, have any quirks, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we join you with that too. We have a question uh, from the audience from Kelsey. Uh, and it says, Maya, what type of student were you in high school? Were you a nerd like me? Any message for our nerdy students? Hashtag nerds rule. So. Um, let's see. Well, as I mentioned, I, I got into, um, into science late, um, you know, late in my teen years. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was pretty nerdy. I was sort of beyond nerdy, I think. You know, I, I was not socially um, adept. You know, I, um, I like dark music and dark clothing, and I hung out in the hallways during recess. Um, you know, I think um, academically, I didn't really come into my own until college, um, when I really got to be surrounded by, by more people who wanted to be sort of appreciated for what was going on in their brain. And, Specifically, finding more more science nerds was really important to me. Um, so yeah, I, I think another thing people talk about with Big Bang is sort of you know there's like nerd chic, um, but I think it's important, especially when I speak to young people, to emphasize that although our show makes it kind of like oh look there's cool nerds, it's still really hard to be different. It's right. always going to be hard to be different, and it's always going to be hard to to be in love with, with physics when you're 13 years old. I promise. That's never going to be like, that's the new dance. It's all about physics. Like, it's not going to happen, I promise. OK, thank you. And uh, sort of two questions I want to ask. One is uh, from the audience, from Christine, what, uh, what is the key to keeping girls involved wow. in STEM? If I knew that, I'd be places other than here right now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think one of the things that, um, I mean, I think there's people who can speak to that on a larger level. Um, and a more, um, a more researched level than I can, but I think what I try, try and do in my part, both in my work with Texas Instruments and elsewhere, is um, to put a positive face on STEM, and in particular to put a female face on STEM. I think emphasizing, I'm sorry that this part of the room's getting my back, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that um, you know, the, the notion of being a lone scientist in a laboratory is not what a STEM career has to look like. It can. You know, some women like to be alone in a laboratory. That's cool, too. Um, but that the STEM fields offer a, a tremendous amount of creative career opportunities, um, flexible opportunities. Um, you can be a mom and be a scientist. You know, I think the more we can sort of let girls um, meet actual women, see examples of women who have made it work, um, you know, 
obviously I'm not just saying it because I'm here. I think teaching is an amazing way to be a, a STEM advocate and a, a role model. So I think there are so many other creative ways to, to present STEM careers in particular to girls as, as, as young as possible also. Um, as a former elementary teacher, uh, tell us about, do you remember anything that happened in science when you were in elementary school? Oh my gosh, yeah, they were like teaching about, there's this thing called the earth. It feels like a million years ago that I was a <laughs> science student in elementary school. Um, I don't know, I like, you know, social studies kind of encompassed a lot of, of the early kind of science knowledge I had. Um, I remember math more concretely when I was a kid. Um, like I said, I will forever remember learning math on that RCA, you know, computer that was like the size of this chair. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's, that's sort of it in particular. When you work with students, what are some of the science activities you like to do with them? Um, well, I taught for about five years after getting my PhD. I designed a neuroscience curriculum um, for mid middle school and high school. Um, also did a special seminar, um, a research seminar in um, great technological advances in neuroscience. And so I was teaching more um, what it looks like to research something and how you look things up. My youngest student was nine. My oldest was 17. It was a, a large age spread, and I worked with each student individually. Um, but that was um, I, really special because I think you know those old-fashioned skills. Like I had to learn the Dewey Decimal System as a kid. Like I learned <laughs> to use the library. I wrote my thesis without the internet being part of really like common culture. So I come from a very different era, you know, than the students that I've taught. Um, and you know, so I think teaching them what it's like to hold a book, go to the library, look it up, it's, it's not the same as looking at it on a computer. I want them to be able to hold a book, to look at the bibliography, to type up a bibliography. So those kind of things I think are skills that students don't even know to want, and mm -hmm. I still think they're really important. Yeah. Got some bibliography Dewey Decimal fans here, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> it's my kind of crowd. <laughs> so, so who won Big Bang Theory? is love science, well, I'm gonna say as much as you or more than that's you. Not, that's like a joke, no one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, of our actors, I'm afraid I'm it, you know? Yeah. I, I'm also the only one who reads comic books and you know, is excited about Captain America next weekend, so. <laughs> um, you know, we have, a, we have a physics consultant, Dr. David Salzberg from UCLA. Um, he's our physics consultant on the show, mm. so he's obviously like super excited about all things science. And there's a couple of our producers and writers um, who, you know, we talk science and we, you know, we'll email things like, hey, did you see that they can make organs out of a printer? You know, like that 3D <laughs> thing. Anyway, so there's, there's a lot of, of general kind of nerd science talk, but yeah, I keep it on the down low with the other actors. No one's interested <laughs> in that with me. Well, we won't share, we won't, we won't expose your secret to no, them. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm uh, a nerd. So, um, <laughs> You talked in your talk, uh, a little bit about you know uh, that sense of that uh, sometimes we give kids the impression you can't do something, and uh, what got you through that that time where you didn't think you could do something? Um, wow, I mean, you know it's it's hard it's hard to not make it sound you know super corny, but um, I specifically remember with my tutor you know in biology, um, she had me build a model of a cell you know a three D model, and um, I think it wasn't so much that there was a moment of like, oh, my brain does work this way, because as I mentioned, it was a really big struggle for me, even through college and even into grad school, um, to grasp things the way other students did, naturally. Um, but I remember when I could touch something, like I could touch that styrofoam cell that I had made, and we cut out that section, and we put that endoplasmic reticulum in there, it was just, it was amazing. It was amazing that um, it thrilled me the way looking at art thrilled me, or the way reading a beautiful poem thrilled me. And, you know, my parents were English teachers, so I was raised like, that's beauty, it's art, and it's, you know, poetry. And I think there was that moment, I mean, it sounds corny, but there was that moment where I saw, like, this is beautiful, I love this, I want to understand this, and it can make me as fulfilled as I thought you could only be if you could paint like Picasso. Okay. <laughs> So, um, after the Big Bang Theory, my next favorite show is Walking Dead. Are you a fan of Walking Dead? You know, I, um, I'm <laughs> told that I would be, but I actually don't watch television. I don't okay. have television. Okay. Yay, that's right. You get a lot done if you don't watch TV, I found. 
<laughs> so we wouldn't want to share that with the advertisers of the big bang well, theory. <laughs> no, he, here, I mean, here's the thing. Like, I think, you know, obviously um, it's super important that people watch TV, but for me in my life and what I do, <laughs> I, I wouldn't get a lot done if, okay. I, if I watched TV. So yeah, I'm that person. Okay. <laughs> uh, how have you used your science education in the background, uh, you know, all of it, K-16, K, uh, to enhance your role as Amy? Um, you know, I, I think it's important to point out that, you know, um, you don't have to be a scientist to play one on TV. Um, you know, I'm an actor. We're supposed to act like whatever they want us to be, right? Um, but for me, you know, Bill Prady, who created Big Bang Theory and is one of our executive producers, he said, you know, when they brought me back in the fourth season, they figured we might as well just make her what Mayim is. Um, so that's sort of how uh, Amy Farrah Fowler became a neurobiologist. Um, you know, Dr. Salzberg, who's a, a physicist, you know, he's got a very broad general science knowledge, as do, um, you know, many of our writers. Uh, once in a while, I'll be asked, you know, like, oh, there was that episode where Sheldon had to uh, take a vacation and work in Amy's lab. He wanted to work in her lab. And so they said, like, you know, what things would he mess up? And the first thing I thought of was he'd get soap on everything and not rinse <laughs> it right. Um, so, you know, sometimes they'll ask me things like that. Our, we try to make our science accurate, but you know, obviously there's only so many things we can show in a neurobiology lab on one desk. You know, mm. I'm not always using the right microscopy stuff, I know, you know? Yeah. So if you could go back in time, what scientist would you have loved to meet? <laughs> um, I, I'd probably say Albert Einstein because it was sort of one of my first introductions to, to scientists and also to the unusual social components of scientists. I remember it was in that report that I did for Professor Fitzgibbon um, that Albert Einstein used to travel, I think, third class on trains. He refused to, you know, have all of that uh, pomp and circumstance, even though he was, you know, obviously one of the most renowned um, scientists in the world at that time. Um, so, yeah, I think that that would probably be. I know it's kind of an easy choice, but it, it holds kind of a, you know, personal significance for me. Mm -hmm. And so, a question from the audience: Will you ever be? Uh, will you ever? Will science ever become your day job? Um, again? Well, you know, the the set of decisions that led me to to leave academia and be home with my boys, who are now eight and five and a half. Um, that set of decisions, you know, is 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 a set of decisions that that women in particular are are confronted with in terms of. Uh, which choices to make, where to give, how to, you know, clone yourself so that you can be a full-time professor and also a full-time parent. Um, so those decisions often lead to a shift in um, what our degree can do in the mm -hmm. larger world. So um, I knew that, you know, I, um, I went back to acting uh, because I, I was running out of health insurance as a grad student <laughs> and um, honestly did not expect to be a regular on a TV show again. I was... I had left the industry. I was for 12 years living the life of a normal person. Um, and I had two young boys at the time. And it literally was one of my first auditions uh, was for this show. So it kind of happened accidentally. I'm grateful I've been able to teach. And I, I probably will, will teach in, in many capacities um, in our community as, as my boys get older. Um, but obviously, you know, as, as many women know, once you leave and don't do a post-talk right away, um, unfortunately, you know, that kind of currency of even a doctorate, um, you know, loses importance. And I, I get to speak to young women a lot, and it's very hard to say that, um, but I'm, I see a lot of nodding heads of women and men. You know, there's a set of decisions that, um, that are very, very difficult. There's not a right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. We all have to do what works for our families, so. Mm -hmm. And I think you already, through your show, are, are continuing your teaching. Well, thank you. No, but it's, but it's different. There's nothing like being there and having a student say, I don't want to learn. And then in you know, three weeks, <laughs> I love learning. <laughs> uh, when you meet students, uh, what is the most often asked question of you? Um, as a scientist or as an actor? Both. Mm. Uh, let's see, you know, as an actor, people want to know what's Sheldon really like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, adults want to know that too. Um, and as a scientist, I get asked a lot, like, why neuro, what's, what's neuroscience? Why would you want to study that? Um, so that's, you know, and I usually, I, I answer as appropriately as I can, you know, that's the level of understanding of the human experience that I wanted to have, um, specifically the electrophysiology of the neuron was um, what led to my love affair with neuroscience, so. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, we know that science is uh, knowledge is uh, rapidly exploding, and so what do you envision the world to be like in five years? <laughs> I don't. 
know. I don't even watch TV. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what's going on. I'm like, I'm still trying to understand why you know girls wear teeny tiny mini skirts instead of nice long ones. I don't know. <laughs> like, um, no, I'm uh, you know I I love the the education technology that I get to work with with Texas Instruments in particular. I mean I've used a graphing calculator since I was 13 years old. I had a TI-81, which I still have, which still works. Um, so in, in, there are certain aspects of technology that um, that I think are critical, you know, especially for for STEM education and, and things like that. But in terms of like the larger world, like I said, I'm very like I'm an old-fashioned person. I still like a typewriter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have a typewriter? Um, I don't have a typewriter. I was actually thinking of buying one, but it seems so silly. But you know, um, I, I there are certain things that I can't give up. I still listen to LPs. I love that sound. That's it still works for me. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of an old-fashioned uh, science nerd. <laughs> OK. Well, we love old-fashioned science Thank nerds, you. by the way. <laughs> uh, so when, when you um, think back to your high school days, a question from the audience was, what was your favorite science experience, experiment um, in high school? You know, I liked chemistry a lot, because there was so much going on. And I like cooking, so I like chemistry, too. <laughs> well, it's a different kind of you know combination and, and ingredients thing. But I wasn't so good at chemistry. My yield was always very, very low. Um, but I do remember uh, Mr. Lewis was my physics teacher in high school. And Mr. Lewis would have us calculate um, all of the aspects and properties of roller coasters. Um, he also, Mr. Lewis liked skydiving, because of course physics teachers like skydiving. And he had us do a whole calculation, you know, like what would it take to kill Mr. Lewis? He, he had us do that. And he, uh, but I remember he brought in a video, you know, they would put the camera on, on the, you know, helmet and you could see. And so those were some fun calculations. And he was a really, you know, young teacher. And I remember that was just always um, really neat that he went skydiving. Like we had that, that physics teacher, so. So with your own uh, boys, how do you foster a love for STEM learning with them? Um, Gosh, I mean, I, I don't know how not to, you know? I see the world as a, as a scientist. Um, math is the most beautiful language in the world. Uh, just everything that we do is, um, is an exploration of the world, you know? Um, I, I take every opportunity I can to, um, to explain things to them. Like, I'm the over-explaining science mom. Um, their dad also, his father's a math teacher, his mother's a microbiologist, his dad's a computer engineer. It's just like, it's nerdville all the time for our kids. <laughs> um, but I love it. I love being able to explain to them like where the moon goes in the day. You know, um, I once, someone once heard me explain that to my son when he was, he must have been about four. And you know, I gave him an age appropriate but totally real explanation of like how the world works. And this person said to me, you know, I would have just said like the sun goes night night, you know? <laughs> like, and then the moon goes night night and they take turns, you know? Um, so kind of everything, you know, every time I cook with my kids, every time, every time we're in the bath and we look at how things float and what density is and like Archimedes, like it's all just part of their life. That's what happens when you view the world that way. Okay. <laughs> do, uh, do you want to answer that question? I don't know. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay. I can, but <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, okay. Um, if you were putting together your uh, zombie apocalypse team, <laughs> besides me, who would be on it? Um, all the producers of Walking Dead. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know. I, um, I, I'm, I never particularly was a zombie person just because I'm a very, I get creeped out really easily. And much as I love the, the natural world, I get freaked out by bugs and lizards and things. Yeah, it's really, it's, I can cut open a brain. I'll dissect that all day. But get a lizard like within 10 feet of me, and I just become a normal person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not a scientist at all about that. Yeah. So, this question from the audience how do you balance every amazing thing um, you do in your life? I already answered it. I don't watch TV, is one yeah. of the things. Um, I gain a lot of my time. I'm not kidding. I gain a lot of my time uh, when my boys are sleeping. I work, I work a lot. I work, um, I write late at night. Um, I get up early in the morning. I don't get a lot of sleep. I mean, this is just the true story. I don't get a lot of sleep. Um, I get up and work before I go to work, and I work after work. 
Um, I, I don't watch TV. I don't have a very active, you know, social life where I'm out, you know, with girlfriends and friends. I don't do a lot of recreational stuff like that. So that's where I find and make a lot of my time. Um, I don't go out to the movies a lot. Like Captain America is very exciting. That'll happen. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I'm a very domestic person, and I, I write for this website, Feller, and I've talked a lot about, you know, like, I don't have a housekeeper, and I don't have a nanny, I don't have a chef, like, it's really like a one-woman show, I promise. <laughs> um, but that means that, you know, you have to prioritize, and so that's one of the ways I do it. You know, I, I do have a fancy assistant, Brandon, and he helps with a lot of the emailing that, that comes in for publicity requests and, and planning things. Um, but I do run my own Twitter account and Facebook. I don't do it very well, because I'm, you know, <laughs> like, it's doing a lot of other things. Um, but I, I get asked that a lot by, by young people, and I think it's important to point out, um, you can't do everything all at once, and I don't. Um, but I choose very carefully how I spend my time and what I do with it. I really want to be with my kids when I'm with my kids. Um, and, you know, uh, I try and take uh, the Sabbath for Jewish people is Friday night to Saturday night. I try and take that as my no technology day. I shut everything off. Um, that actually recharges me so that I have you know, six other days to be a slave to technology. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say uh, when, when you're on the set? What are your days like? Mm, well, we film in front of a live audience, um, which is really fun. And, and it's a really special way to be a performer because it's kind of like theater and you get to do it many times. So we film, um, we film in front of a live audience one day a week. The other four days are rehearsal. Um, I kind of work school hours for those rehearsal days, which is kind of nice. You know, it's like 9 to 3 or 10 to 2. It depends. I mean, there's a lot of other work stuff I do. But it's pretty much like school hours. And then we do a, a, a camera blocking day, which is usually a longer day. And then um, our tape night, we go in at noon, and we're there till like 10.30 at night or so. It doesn't take that many hours to, to film it, but it's about a four or five hour process, actually, to film, to film one episode. And we work about um, three weeks out of every month. This is a week off for me. You guys are my, my couple days off. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're glad to help. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I go home to my boys uh, first thing in the morning. So, um, so yeah, so we get a week off, and then we're off for the summer. I mean, I grew up you know, with parents. I thought every parent was off on summer vacation. <laughs> um, that's one of the best things I think about. I mean, sometimes my, my parents would teach summer school, um, but it's really neat like to grow up with parents who are, are off in the summer like that. Um, so yeah, I'm off, I'm off May, June, and July, and we go back in August to make more TV shows. OK, thanks. And a question from the audience from Sandy. What's your favorite formula? <laughs> uh, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, have, I have a lot of favorite formulas, you know. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot, but I'd say that's, that's, that's the one that I'm proud to remember, I guess, for the longest. Well so, uh, what advice would you give students who are passionate about arts and science? Um, well, I, I think there's, there's room for every person to be all the things that they want to be. Um, there's, not, there's not necessarily you know, forks in the road that make you choose one or the other. Fortunately, we live in a relatively democratic country um, where we get to, to be all the things we want to be and we're not told what we have to be or what we can or can't pursue. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of intersection between art and science and there's a you know, whole set of fields that are exploring uh, one of my interests in, in uh, in college and in grad school was um, you know, the brain and art and how, um, how, how artistic brains work and how they're different. So there's actually a lot of intersection of those fields. Um, but I, I don't think that there has to be, um, the, there don't have to be those kind of choices made. Um, you know, I, I sometimes get you know, young people say to me like, I wanna be an actress and a neuroscientist. And I promise that's not the easiest way to go about your <laughs> life. There's a lot about my life that's very accidental. <laughs> So uh, we know, w certainly with your boys, this would be happening that, you know, we know that there's part of the education happens uh, in schools mm -hmm. and certainly out of school with the parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about things like the informal science, like zoos and museums and uh, aquariums around the um, country? Well, I think, you know, as I sort of spoke about, I think it's important to reach, um, to reach young people as many ways as possible because you don't know what's going to work for every particular student. Some students really like a book and a desk and a, you know, a, a pencil, if people still use those in classrooms. Um, but some kids need to touch things, and some kids need to, to move around. Some kids need to move around while learning. Um, 
I, I happen to not do zoos and aquariums just because I'm a person that doesn't do zoos and aquariums. <laughs> but, um, but museums is a huge part um, you know, of my, my boy's life. And um, you know, besides uh, remembering so fondly what a field trip felt like you know, to get out of your school and be put on a bus and be yelled at by a bus driver. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, no, but, but field trips, I think it, it's important to realize, I mean, we all know why that is so important. Um, no one wants to learn in a box, you yeah, know? Yeah. And um, so I, I think we're seeing so much more of that. And I'm, I'm so grateful that, that education has expanded so much, even since, you know, since, since I was a kid, um, to, to realize how much of that um, is important and supplemental. And, and for some kids, is the key to their, their engagement and their interest. Mm -hmm. So from the audience, what's your biggest inner nerd moment? Oh, it's so nerdy. It's so nerdy. Um, the only person I have ever cried when meeting was Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> 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 like, it's so nerdy that not everyone even knows what I'm talking about. It's like a subset of this room knows what it means to meet Weird Al at the Twilight premiere of all places. <laughs> like, um, and I, I literally, I started crying. I mean, like, I'm, I'm, like, I grew up on, like, Mad Magazine and Weird Al. Like, that was it, so. <laughs> so you had mentioned that you have your original calculator. And My TI-81, yep. How do TI calculators help build an interest in science? Well, I think one of the things that, um, for me, especially as I got the kind of appropriate support for my, my STEM kind of education, um, you know, to be able to, to hold a piece of equipment that is literally what, that, what science people use when they grow up, um, that's really powerful. And, you know, my TI-81 lasted me all the way through college and grad school. And I think especially, you know, if you've seen the, the Inspire, it's in color, you can download pictures, you can attach temperature probes and physics probes and chemistry probes, you can calculate pH and it'll graph it on your, on your graphing calculator. I mean. I, I think it's so it's so special for young people to be able to to feel what it's like to be a scientist, and I think that's something that um, that's missing from a lot of young people's mm -hmm. um, experiences as as young scientists or as budding scientists. Okay, so uh, this question I'm not sure what it means, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> Batman oh, or Captain America? Oh, I know America. what that means. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, how to answer the question? Um, you know, I. Many people choose Batman as their favorite, you know, superhero um, because he doesn't have supernatural powers. And I think it's something that there's a very specific type of, of, of child and adult, um, sometimes male but often female, that really identifies with someone that isn't supernaturally exquisite or exceptional but uses the powers of the brain and logic and skill and understands physics enough to know how your body can be catapulted across the space. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the Batman um, allure. You know, for me, the Captain America is such a, a phenomenal story because of the historical context that Captain America was written in. Um, the notion of a super soldier at a time in American history, honestly, where this was a really important, I'm super nerdy, do you guys, is it clear? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's also for me to see the embodiment of Captain America in an actor that so looks like the superhero of my childhood imagination, I mean, he's a, a specimen of superhero perfection. So, um, <laughs> I, I think that he is, I'm not, it's true. Um, so I think the, the aspect of a manufactured, supernaturally powerful, strong, and defensive personality, um, I think is a, a, another really alluring aspect. Um, I actually happen to be a real X-Men fan because I like the politics of X-Men. Um, I, I like this sort of notion, I think it's a very important notion. I mean, I use superheroes to teach my boys a lot um, about, you know, sort of, how people function, where people are exceptional, and how we treat them. And I think X-Men is a really great example of what it means to be perceived as different. And if you've seen the origin stories, it obviously talks about World War II and what it meant to be different. Anyway, I will stop the nerd fest now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when my children were younger and we'd go on vacations, we uh, always, and recently I, I had our grandson at, at, um, at Disney and I couldn't resist talking about uh, the um, physics of the lighting at the Hot End Mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever take your kids on science vacation? Um, well, I think I've made it clear everything is a science <laughs> vacation where I come from. Um, I don't know if we've done, I mean, we, 
we do a lot of things in the natural world. Um, we do a lot of hiking. We go camping. Um, I don't really do um, like expensive, you know, expensive vacation kind of stuff with my kids. Um, the other day, my eight-year-old said, "Why can't we fly first class?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Because it's really expensive." <laughs> um, you know, when I was a kid, we, we we did not afford large vacations, and we would get in the car and go to all the national parks and drive wherever we could on summer vacation. So um, I do that. Um, a uh, lot of fights in that station wagon, though, let me tell you. A lot of melted crayons, too. Um, but, um, you know, we, we do that a lot with our, with our boys still. We want them to, to see the natural world and also not to feel that they have to pay for things to enjoy them, which I think is a really important lesson um, as well. Um, one of my dreams is to take them. There's these Antarctica um, expeditions you can do with families. Um, I'd love to, you know, see the Galapagos. I'd love to... to, um, to there, are, there are certain kinds of like National geographic -y family trips that you could do. And even though I'm divorced, my ex and I are such like co-parenting happy nerds, like we would totally, we would love to do that with our kids together and we probably will. So they just need to be a little older because you know, five-year-olds still like need to poop at the worst time and you can't <laughs> do things like when they're still that little. So yeah. we're getting there. Well, I've never been to Gal Galapagos and if I, if you go, I could gladly go and help take care there of the boys. There you go. It's a so whole just, field trip just so we you just know. made. <laughs> yes. Uh, a question from the audience and, uh, of uh, if there is anything you'd like to say about your preview of the uh, STEM behind Hollywood. Um, well, I mean, we think it's really awesome. We, we literally, uh, it'll be in this room, we will literally be showing this, um, the, the, the zombie apocalypse uh, set of exercises, um, how, we, how we use them, what kinds of questions come from it, um, there's some really cool graphics and um, there, there's some really kind of fundamental notions um, about science and also math that, um, that we get to teach. So um, it, I, I think it's super cool and anything that involves zombie apocalypse, I think you should be part of. And I will be wearing my lab coat, my real lab coat that I've worn since I was in, uh, yeah, I guess high school. I will be in a lab coat later today. Okay, okay. And uh, as we conclude, I, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I invite you to come and we could explore the physics of sound and music. Okay, I'm gonna choose Galapagos over that, but okay. that could be a close <laughs> second. <laughs> well, the second on your way to the other Great. place. Okay, so I like, I, I'm sure you have enjoyed this, and I, uh, a warm uh, thank you to Mayim, and uh, come thank back you. at two, noon. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>